poem you are about to hear sung is from an American folk hymn, one of the earliest still in existence. It was found in a collection of music by Joshua Smith of New Hampshire and was published in 1784, but old Joshua didn't compose it. The composer is anonymous, but is believed to be a New Englander who lived in the late 1600s. It's a very New England hymn, I think, comparing Jesus Christ to, of all things, an apple tree. I love this hymn and its images. Jesus Christ, symbol of divine fruit to feed and as shelter for the weary traveler, and as a source of beauty to comfort the human soul. Listen with me as our gifted musical guest brings the good news. Dr. O'Driscoll, welcome. The tree of life my soul has seen, lay down with fruit and always green. The tree of life my soul has seen, lay down with fruit and always green. The tree of nature. Isn't that lovely? Thank you, Dr. O'Driscoll. And thank you, Rana, for putting up with the whims of a visiting preacher, finding both the song and the singer. Will you pray with me? God of tree and flower and human and bee, Gather our thoughts and our myriad feelings this day and weave them into one unified thought. 
for the healing of your people, for the healing of your nations, for your name's sake and for all. Amen. I cannot preach in this pulpit without expressing my gratitude to our leadership. To the brilliant people who hired Reverend Robin, Robin Bartlett, Bartlett are, are any of you here today that had something to do with that? Yeah, raise your hands if you would. Can we give them a round of applause? You know what you've got there, don't you? And to the insightful folks who hired Reverend Zach and paved the way for Pizza Church and this amazing to ministry to young people like my own children uh, who were that age uh, way too long ago, and so many of our own youth, most youth really, who need a safe space. I am so grateful and proud. If you had something to do with that and that ministry, will you raise your hand so we can applaud you and give thanks to God? Come on, if you have something to do with that, yay! <laughs> and to our deacons and pastoral care team who work so hard to make sure that old people like Chuck and me and hurting people and grieving people and hungry people get cared for as Jesus commands, and we can thank them by remembering to put an offering for our deacons fund in those baskets later this morning. We could not be more grateful to have found you and are humbled that you welcome us to be a part. And to our amazing divine God, who may not always do all we want the way we want he, she, they to do it, but always, always does what is meet and right to do. Amen? Amen. Take today's poem or, uh, or hymn. I love the poet's use of Jesus as apple tree, symbol of the desire, divine desire to feed, nurture, and protect us in the very way every New England grandparent desires to feed us. Our scripture also makes use of the tree as a profound symbol for the love of the divine and for God's provision of fruit and shelter and comfort. In the very last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the author, John of Patmos, has a vision of what heaven will be like. And now the book of Revelation has to be read carefully, for there is much in it that does not seem to fit with Jesus' clear teaching of the unconditional love of God. But this image of the tree of life, which we just read together, is an image of love and care for us. Can you see the picture the author paints? In the kingdom of God, there is a city, a beautiful city, and th flowing through the center of the city is this river of the waters of life. Don't you know, it is beautiful, sparkling, life-giving water, bright and clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of the divine down through the middle of the city, nourishing all in the city that none would be thirsty. And on either side of that beautiful river, the tree of life grows. The image is of two trunks, one on either side of the river, reaching across and joining together like an arbor. Scripture says it produces 12 kinds of fruit, one for each month of the year. So there is no month when the people of God are without delicious fruit. One final image from this scripture. The leaves of the tree, the author says, shall be for the healing of the nations. Oh, do we not need those leaves to fall on us now? Amen. 
the leaves of the tree shall be for the healing of the nations. This magnificent tree seems to have the abundance of an apple tree and the medicinal uses of eucalyptus and perhaps baobab combined. The baobab, do you know that tree? Perhaps you have read the Antoine de saint Zubery children's book, The Little Prince. He used, he used the image of the baobab in that book, but didn't think much of it. However, long before I'd ever seen an apple tree or tasted an apple, I lived under the shade of a baobab. And I can tell you, it is a beautiful tree. Its roots reach deep into the arid African soil, drawing moisture and nutrients from the soil miles around. Its branches spread tall and wide and strong, shading entire households from the heat of the sun. Its fruit is nutritious and is believed to lower blood pressure and help fight infection and inflammation. Its trunk can get so huge, yards and yards and yards in diameter, so that when a baobab finally dies, the set entire village has been known to hide the most vulnerable of its people, children and the sick and the elderly, all inside its hollowed trunk in times of war. A tree that is dead but still sheltering life. Like the tree of life described in Revelation, the baobab is a tree of abundance and shade and protection and healing. Did you know that the tree of life appears in the mythologies of several ancient civilizations? There is a difference in the symbolism though in many of those mythologies, the tree of life is jealously guarded by armed soldiers of the gods made inaccessible to humans. And something in those myths rings true. So much of our lives can be spent grasping after abundance and assurance and comfort and peace that seems just beyond our reach as if the soldiers of the gods who rule this life are keeping us from it. And we can live as if that is what rules our lives, and we have to fight for scarcity instead of living in abundance. But in our text for today, the tree of life is a gift, a free and generous gift for all of humanity to enjoy. God intends for us to live life with abundance and joy. Amen? But not us alone. Not us alone. God also intends for all the world to live life with abundance and joy. In New England, we are in the midst of harvest season, a season that celebrates abundance and joy. And we will gather around harvest tables filled with abundance. I think, I think we are receiving an invitation from the tree of life as we gather under her abundant branches to invite someone around our tables perhaps someone like Jesus named in the Beatitudes. And if you remember some of the people Jesus named, and if your life is anything like mine, complicated and busy, you may be joining me and also wondering how we might possibly manage to do that and keep our sanity. How might we include in our harvest celebrations the poor, the hungry, the meek, those who weep and grieve, those who feel hated and isolated or alone, those even more sad or depressed than we are. God Almighty, how are we going to do that? 
What is it our pastor asked us to repeat after her? We can do hard things. I don't know quite how, but I think we begin by remembering the God who loves us unconditionally. The God who loves not only us, but all God's children as well. I suspect then, with the amazing creativity in this place, we will figure out ways to include the very people God is asking us to include, even as we give thanks for beauty and abundance. And then we will be able to look around and over our harvest table and sing with Dr. O'Driscoll. Won't you sing with us the tree of life my soul has seen laden with fruit and always green? The tree of life my soul As I was writing the sermon for this morning, I was haunted by a harvest festival celebration in my own home when our four children were young and still living at home. I was then the senior pastor trying to rescue a tiny downtown church in Indianapolis of all the unlikely places for me, a young liberal pastor for my sins, trying to do ministry in a very conservative place. My beloved spouse had just found a job he loved as a conference minister, a job that took him on the road a good bit of the time. And I was a pastor to a congregation that embraced a commitment of hospitality to its neighbors, which is one of the things I adored about them but an aging congregation that really didn't understand who their newest neighbors were. Their newest neighbors moving into downtown Indianapolis to refurbish historic older neighborhoods were many, many of them gay and lesbian, and it was the early 1990s, which meant that many were gay men caught amidst the terrifying AIDS epidemic, that aging, dying, well-meaning, predominantly white, straight identifying, and definitely homophobic congregation had to decide very early if they meant what they said about loving their neighbors. They decided they meant what what they said, thanks be to God. But it wasn't easy on them, and we had to say some painful goodbyes to some folks we loved who didn't agree with our decision. Anybody know anything about that? Meanwhile, in my own home, my mothering and pastoring kind of melded together because I was trying to teach my children the same thing I was hoping to teach the congregation about the unconditional love of God, and they were becoming teenagers, so that was not easy all the time. 
even as I was trying to unlearn things I'd been taught and try to reteach myself a thing or two about love. So during the harvest season, I invited elderly couples from the congregation, you know, old folks who were then about the age Chuck and I are now, people who either had no family or were alienated from family or separated by miles from family to join us for dinner at home. And right before dinner, I invited them to join us in a tradition taught me by my parents to hold hands around the table and offer a word of gratitude to the divine. I will never forget the response to my invitation one evening in front of two of the most prominent leaders of the church when I invited them to join us in a blessing. And one of our lovely children, and it's probably by God's grace that I do not remember which one of the little darlings, announced to the whole table, we only do this prayer stuff when we have company. <laughs> I will go to God swearing that that is not true. However, it did give me pause to think that what was true is that lately we had not often sit, sat down together at table between Chuck's travel schedule and my evening meetings, between the children's band rehearsals and play practice. And I now watch my grandsons running off to football practice and games here in Sterling and the eldest to cross country for the high school in Holden. And I don't know how their parents manage any sit down meals at all. Anybody know that dance? And yet, on those rare occasions when we, as family, get to sit around table together in our home or the home of our daughters, whatever the shape and size of our family, the more diverse and word weird the better, for that is the gospel, thanks be to God. We invite each other to offer a word of gratitude to whatever higher power we name as ours for all that is good and gracious and lovely. And this world needs all that it can get of that. Amen.